Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Hugo Blick to talk all about his latest series, The English, of which he is the writer and director of the show. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the language of the series and writing the scripts, because, you know, there's such rich textured language. There's also the way that it feeds into the genre and the time period of the piece. And then you've obviously got the individual elements and voices of different characters where some are more exposition heavy in their dialogue, others are more insular and introverted. And so it's interested when you first started writing the scripts, how you really focused in on the specific language that you wanted to use overall, and then how that paired into the way you were finding the voices of each of the individual characters. Yeah, good question. Um, um, uh, Jimmy Stewart uh, said that uh, when he used to get a script for a Western, he sort of said, I could intuit whether a script had a chance of being good as a Western by being slim, a slim script. And it's obvious, really, because, you know, obviously there's a lot of action in there. So, you know, want it to be uh, baggy in, in dialogue to start with because you're going to have the action. But I took him to heart because I, I think they are essential exercises, exercises in essentialism. Um, and, and so wherever I could, uh, I looked to strip language out. I, I don't want to hold on to language. Yes, it's an elevated space. The Western is operatic. It's called a horse opera. Everybody sings but the horses. That's the point. That's what they are. But if you can try and take on that kind of I don't know, Steve McQueen thing where you, you kind of cast off your dialogue so that when you get to say what you say, what you say gets heard. And, and particularly for Eli, Chaske Spencer's character, that was the pursuit. But then when you start doing that, you can't have everybody behaving like that. Otherwise, it just becomes epigrammatic. It's just like everybody's speaking in one voice. So I, I, I suppose I hope that the interest is, say, Cornelia, you know, Emily's character. She talks a lot. You know, she's talking, talking all the time, really. And But she's talking all the time in face of a guy who's not saying anything at all. So between that, those two elements, there's some tension there. There's some, some intrigues, there's some stress. So in terms of language rhythm, you get this sort of uh, syncopation. It's like jazz. And that's what I think is kind of effective. It's certainly in keeping with the genre because the genre always had those rhythms. There's a wit to the, to the genre when it's, I think, at its most interesting. And that's certainly something that the English looks to engage in. And speaking of genre in the directing of the show, I love how you've paid a real homage to it. You know, there's moments of real tension and slow build. There's music that really utilizes the sounds of the genre. There's that, you know, that classic close up on Chaske's eyes at one point in the middle of a standoff. And yeah. so how did you find the spaces in, in figuring out what you wanted to do with the camera and how you visually wanted to tell the story of finding those instances of this is where yeah. I really want to bring the elements of the genre in, but yeah. this is also where I have a bit more freedom in terms of the modern landscape that I'm making this in? Well, uh, by the time you're making it, you've stopped thinking about all of that and you just make the picture that you you, you kind of feels in your own DNA. But in your development of the picture, I, I, I spent all my time, it was a great pleasure, going back and watching the golden era of the genre of the mid 20th century with particular interest in Anthony Mann. I, I loved Anthony Mann pictures. Um, uh, uh, George Stevens, and, and then of course, the, the great Clint Eastwood, Outlaw Josie Wales, what a picture. So you, you take all that on, you take a lot of what they speak about when you research what they, how they uh, look to make the pictures. Eastwood said, you know, if you can try and put your film schedule into the fall or spring because the sun will be on the slant behind you. And, you know, that's what the kind of things we engage with. And then there's the Sergio Leone, there's the uh, Sergio Cabucci, there's the sort of spaghetti aspect of the of the story. And I got to shoot this picture in Spain. That outsider perspective, I thought was really interesting and really integral. So there are all those elements as you're uh, as you're constructing your idea of the story. But when you film it, you just got to feel it, you know. And and although the technical side of it required the very big heavy cameras, very big heavy lights that we had to give it that classic look. And that meant we couldn't really move the camera very much technically, logistically. So, if, you know, such talent that there be in me, it was to try and figure where best to put the camera so it wouldn't move. So we'd still see the story. And, and um, hopefully that works out. And, and in doing so, it made it kind of elegant and confident because it doesn't, it doesn't look to roam around the set or the location trying to find out where the story is. It kind of seems to know where the story is and holds its frame. And after that, you just got to just feel your way through the filming. Because in a weird way, no matter how you prepare, the story will tell itself, no matter what happens. It knows what it wants to say. You just not got to get in the way. 
So hopefully that's what I did. I didn't and you were bringing up the idea of, of tension within the show before in, in terms of dialogue and characters, but there's obviously also a lot of moments where it is in the middle of a potential shootout or potential mm. action that's going to come forth, but it really holds and lingers and, and builds those moments. And so when you when you were directing those moments in capturing even just, okay, where's every single character in this, in this roundabout mm. at mm. emotionally as we're going into mm. this, as they're all kind of exchanging glances, mm. how did you kind of shoot it, making sure that you were always holding getting every single character perspective, well, making sure that you'd have enough footage and then editing it together and finding the rhythm. Yeah, we, we, we uh, storyboarded it quite a bit and uh, uh, those action sequences. But funny enough, um, and, 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 and this I have said to no one else uh, except my first AD who just couldn't believe it when I did it, is actually those, those structured uh, moments, I stole my children's Playmobil and shot them for myself on my camera, each angle, and then took the photographs, made them into little um, uh, strips, as it were, on, on paper, and sent my first AD pictures of my Playmobil, sold cowboys and Indians that they had, uh, uh, for him to then make sense of how we were going to schedule it. I thought I'd been a genius. He then realized he'd never worked with me before. And at the time, he thought I was a lunatic. He was working with a lunatic who was sending pictures of Playmobil because he wanted to make a Batman movie with Lego or something. I don't know. But actually, for me, I could show you now, shot to shot, the Playmobil and what I shot, and they look almost identical. So I don't know how that happened. I definitely want to want to see that on the internet at some point. <laughs> I also wanted to talk about Emily's costumes in particular. I mean, there's such beautiful use of color in the way that you've told the story, but in particular, the contrast of kind of the reds and pinks and the real vibrancy of her character. And then you've really specifically detailed out costumes that follow the emotional trajectory, that follow her becoming more confident in this landscape and starting to absorb herself into it. Um, and so what was the starting point of, of finding that visual aesthetic and then well, the, um, the, the, the starting point was that it was an opera. If you, if you cast your mind to that first episode, if you've seen it when she first arrives, you have a, a, a number of essential elements in the super wide. There's one, it's a hotel space, there's a, a stagecoach, and then there's uh, individual men. And we drop back to the wide and you, you see this kind of essentialism in it. And in order for that to continue to feel essential, we needed to see someone, a woman come out of there at that distance and understand it. And it was pink, this vivid pink coming out of the, of the stagecoach. So then you got to see this essential femininity in this incredibly austere, dangerous, masculine environment. She looks as if she's, uh, well, she's Mary Poppins. She's literally Mary Poppins in a way. And she turns out, she thinks she's going to have control of the situation. She immediately loses control. But we underestimate her at her peril, at our peril, the story's peril, because she starts to work her way back up into an understanding of the environment in the story. And as she does, her costume changes. But what's intriguing is, as you say, she kind of becomes part of the landscape, but that landscape is bruised. So those purples and those plums, it's kind of also saying something about the secret that she holds within herself, about herself. And it's it speak the costume reflects upon the internal dynamic and psychology of her character. So that was intuited by, you know, my early thoughts and then by our costume designer, Phoebe DeGay, who did a wonderful job on a, on a series called Killing Eve with Jodie Comer. And she just set Jodie Comer's um, essentially quite masculine assassin characteristic with that tension of femininity in it. And so when she met with me, I knew that she would intuit on that kind of costume journey to female psychology of warrior and what it means to be a warrior. So yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, it's such a fantastic series and I love everything that you've done in the way that you've told this story visually and narratively. So congratulations on that and thank you so much, Hugo. Great, great to speak with you.